would like to dedicate this um, teaching and this learning that we do together this evening to my mother who, um, who would have turned 71 today. Um, so, um, yes, and I will start by sharing my screen. Perhaps this is the image that you have. It probably was the image I had of uh, a scribe, if I think of who writes Torahs. Um, a man and, uh, you know, someone with a long beard and uh, he looks very, you know, he looks very religious. Um, not that it's necessarily a look, but, um, but there are some things that I have in common with this, um, with this picture of the scribe. I do work with a feather and I do work on with parchment, which I will, I will get to, uh, I'll get to in a, in a moment. But it's interesting, this is some people's assumption um, about who is a scribe, but I, I, the first tour that I wrote was at a museum as part of an exhibit. And um, someone asked the question once, they saw me working, they watched and, and they said, are men also scribes or is this just something that, that women do? Um, which I thought was great um, because this was their first encounter with a scribe and here I was, I, a young woman, this was more than 10 years ago. Um, so um, that, I thought that was, pretty, that was pretty great. So, so uh, about women scribes, I'm starting with this and I, as a kind of to get us into the material process because it is a little bit unusual um, that I am a, a woman who is a scribe and it's definitely something that's kind of new. So there were women scribes in history, we do have evidence of that, but in terms of technically a woman who has written a Torah scroll, a scroll that is um, read from and chanted from in synagogue, the first woman that we know of who it completed a Torah scroll was Jen Taylor Friedman, one of my teachers, and she did that in 2007, so not too long ago. And I started learning from her in 2008. And um, so, some basics. I actually, I actually wanted to, uh, well, I have a poll for us, um, I, which will require some, um, you know, a little bit of typing. You'll be asked a question and, and I'll ask you to answer it. I, I, I wanted to get a sense of, of, um, of how, how uh, what we think about how long the Torah is. But, um, but first, a couple of basics. The Torah is the, the five books of Moses. So it is written out, it, it's, it's handwritten, um, and it, but it does not include, it's not the whole Bible. Um, it's just the first five books, the Torah. The five, the five books of Moses. But it's still quite long. Um, and uh, I, the poll that I want to, or the question I want to ask via this poll is, how many letters do you think are in a Torah scroll? This is sort of like guessing how many candies are in the jar. Um, so Ben, if you could run that poll now, that would be awesome. Ben, are you with me? He may have lost it. Yeah, they oh. are voting. Uh, oh, you have 50 I didn't know I didn't see anything. Answered. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, getting up there. Almost everyone's cast a vote. With the share screen, you can't, it's like I can't see anything except what's, you know, except the picture. Uh, so it looks like most people have voted and we, the winner is 600,000 letters with uh, 48 people, 53%. Uh, number two is 300,000, looks like 32 people, 35% chose that option. Uh, the third one is 150,000, that got eight votes, and a whopping three people say it's 75,000. Okay, so I'm going to come back for a second and tell you that, the, that there are 304,805 letters in the Torah, so approximately 300,000. However, I know why most of you guessed 600,000. And that is because the Talmud says that there are 600,000 letters in the Torah. But that's just kind of the Talmud's number for like 
a billion, like like a just such a like a such a huge amount, right? There's it's too big, too many to even count. We're not even sure. Like a lot of people, um, right? There's like a special blessing that is said if six hundred thousand Jews um, congregate in one place. So six hundred thousand is kind of like a lot. Um, but if you do count the letters, I did. I I have to. I will admit, I did not personally count them, but I trust the sources. There are three hundred four thousand eight hundred and five. Um, and it, it, so it takes kind of a long time to write by, out by hand. Um, it takes between a year and a year and a half, and that is not as a side gig. Um, that's really like working on it pretty full on. Um, and we should all consider doing it because it is actually a mitzvah. Um, it is the 613th, which doesn't mean it's the least important, it just means like in terms of the narrative chronology of where the mitzvahs uh, occur in the Torah, it is a mitzvah to write a Sefer Torah. I do have some good news for you, though, if you don't um, want to spend a year and a half writing a Torah, which is that if you write one letter in a Torah, it is considered as if you wrote the whole thing. Because if that one letter was missing, the Torah would not be kosher and it would not be able to be used. So your letter in effect made the Torah a Torah, if that makes sense. Um, there, it, another thing that's interesting about this mitzvah of writing a Torah is that there's no blessing associated with it until it is read, it's until the mitzvah is finished, right? Most, uh, some things, some mitzvahs and some blessings, you know, you say a blessing over bread and then you, you eat the bread and there's not so much of a gap between the, the blessing and the action. So I think that's part of why perhaps there's no blessing associated with it. you'd say the blessing and like a year and a half later, you know, you eat a piece of stale bread. I mean, um, there's just so much time that lapses between when you would say the blessing and when you would complete the mitzvah. Um, but there are blessings, of course, for the reading of the Torah. However, there is something similar to a blessing. Um, there's a statement of intention. Intention or kavanah in Hebrew really permeates all aspects of writing a safer Torah. What is the intention of the person doing it? Um, so a scribe says before they start to write, I am writing for the sake of the Kedusha, the sanctity of the Torah before they start. Um, and you can say it multiple times. I like to say it every day, but that one time and takes you through the whole process and, and sets that intention. Um, okay, I'm going to pause for a moment before we get to the materials that are used and see if there are any pressing questions on the topic that, on the topics that came up. I see there are a bunch of things on the, in the chat. Um, okay. There was a question uh, about handedness. Am I okay? Am I left-handed? So I, I have a feeling this was coming from the picture of that first scribe because he's left-handed. So I'm not left-handed, I'm right-handed. However, you can be right or left-handed to be a scribe. Um, there is a rule that if you're right-handed, you have to write with your right hand, and if you're left-handed, you have to write with your left hand. Um, so you have to write with your dominant hand. Um, and even though you would think, so Hebrew goes from right to left, right? So I am go like this. I, I, this probably shows up backwards on the screen, so it's even more complicated than it already is. But I'm writing, and remember, I'm writing with liquid ink. We'll get to that in a, in a minute. So you think, oh, I'm in danger of smudging, right? The letters that I just wrote with my right hand. And I am in danger of smudging. And in fact, when I was first learning, I did a lot of smudging. But lefties have different issues, like a, another issue, and it has to do with how the letters are formed and the fact that you pull the ink, you don't push the ink. So the strokes of the letters um, are towards you, and for a lefty, it's kind of the it, the inverse way. So, um, actually, one of, pro, one of the most renowned, not the, the most renowned Hebrew calligrapher in the world, Izzy Pludwinski, um, wrote a book called Mastering Hebrew Calligraphy. If you're interested in Hebrew calligraphy, you should definitely check out this book. It is incredible, and um, he has a I don't know if a whole chapter, but a section for lefties because he is a lefty. And, and I, I know at least sometimes he writes with the paper sideways and, and, and writes down um, because it's, it's a little complicated. 
Okay. Um, so let's see, what else do we have here? Um, okay, left, left handed. Computer scanning to count and check the work. Okay, um, Andrew, yes, there is. I'm gonna get to, I'm gonna get to that um, later in the lecture, the whole issue of errors and how it's checked. And Tanya, what made me want to be a SOFAIR a scribe? Okay, that's a good question. Something I, I tend to leave out, though it is something. <laughs> Maybe because I'm not entirely sure of the answer or that there are so many answers. Um, but I would say the main reason I became a scribe has to do with my love for uh, language and specifically Hebrew language. And I am just so amazed by what, I mean, specifically what written language can do and how it trans has transformed our ability to communicate not only with, not only across space, with people across the globe, but, um, but across time. So that we can communicate um, through the generations and that we have information and um, a story given to us from from so many um, years ago and the fact that we can then now communicate that information to future generations I just think that's very beautiful and I, I loved um, the idea of being part of that chain of transmission um, do I consider myself an artist or a language specialist or both um, I don't consider my art myself an artist more of a crafts person um, I think of art as having like a lot of creativity um, and I, I don't think of this particular craft as having, you know, you don't make things up. You really, you're, you're following the, the rules. Um, so, but it's not that it's not artistic, but I, I think of it, yeah, as more of, more as a craft. Um, somebody did math, a hundred letters per hour. Um, you know, that's actually, re that's actually pretty accurate, I think, <laughs> come to think of it. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks, thanks Ben for putting Izzy Pludwinski's name in the chat. And okay, let's see, anything else here? Does a Torah scroll need to be created in a, in a certain environment like a sacred space? Um, it does not have to be in a particular place. So it does not have to be created in a synagogue. It does not have to be, you know, created in its own, you know, special room. Um, I have an office, I'm sitting in my office at, at home and this is where I create um, Torah scrolls. I actually just finished one last Thursday. So it's not here anymore, but, um, but it was. And um, I guess probably the only rule would be you, you couldn't create a Torah scroll in the bathroom. I know it sounds kind of crass, but that, yeah. So that would not be permitted. But, but other than that, um, there aren't, you know, there aren't specific rules for, you know, it has to be like in this, um, you know, special sacred place. Of course, you want to you want to set aside um, where you're writing for that task. Um, you don't want it to be like, you know. Well, of course. Also, all the all these other um, thoughts are coming to my head. On not in the kitchen. Um, you know, that's sort of t like kind of obvious. But um, so, but I think the question was more about does it have to be created in the synagogue? Um, no, and I think most scribes actually work from home. Did my mother live long enough to see me become a Torah scribe? That's such a sweet question. Um, thanks, Reba, for asking me that. She got to see me practicing. So I want to think that maybe she knew I was on a, on a path. Um, how many women Torah scribes are there? Um, it kind of depends how you count, but, I, but the number's growing. So it used to be like, well, I would say there's a, a minion of us. Um, but there's more now and um, more and more women are, are learning, um, not necessarily women who have completed Torah scrolls, but they are, I hope, on their way to, to doing so. Okay, I know there are more questions, but I'm going to continue with the, um, with the slideshow here just for a moment and I'll come back to the question box. Oh, this was for this is this was for the poll to kind of give you a sense of all the letters uh, piled up, kind of like the jelly beans in the in the jar. Okay, so Torah scrolls are written on parchment. Um, 
Parchment is made from the skins of a kosher animal. Um, the kosher animal has to be a, a strong enough skin and um, big enough. So the main animals that are used for the writing of Torah scrolls are cow, actually mostly cow these days, um, but it has been also in the past and still to some extent, sheep, goat, and the last one, I'll give you a moment to think about this and maybe guess out louder in the chat, the fourth, um, the fourth animal that Torahs are written on that folks sometimes forget is actually a kosher animal is deer. Um, interestingly, the animal does not need to have been killed in the manner that's required for it to be kosher to eat. In fact, it's not permitted to kill an animal in order to use its skin to write sacred writings. It has to be dead of its own accord, have died of natural causes or some other cause, um, or have been already slaughtered for food, and then you can use its skin. So, but it, it can have been slaughtered for food in a way that is not kosher. So for example, a hunted deer, or I sometimes, I live in the Hudson Valley, New York, and I see all the time um, deer that have been hit by cars. And I always think, oh, I, I would like to, you know, make roadkill to fill in, um, and at least like do something with that, that skin, um, that makes me, kind of sad. Um, I know you're all wondering, what about a giraffe? It's true, giraffes are kosher. Um, and my teacher, Jen, always, my, Jen Taylor Friedman, the one I mentioned before, she would always talk about wanting to write a Megillah scroll, a scroll of Esther, on the skin of a giraffe because she wouldn't have to sew pieces together. It would be long enough, like right, the neck, it would be long enough to write the entire Megillah on just one piece. Now, um, yeah, she's hoping to make friends with some zookeeper. I made friends with a zookeeper and I, and I asked her about like, if a giraffe dies, do you think I could get the skins? And she was like, not a chance. So um, I don't think that that is going to happen. Um, so you can actually see on the parchment, I don't know if you've looked inside Torah and seen um, you know, spots on the parchment. I, I joke that this, these are coffee stains, but they're not coffee stains. This is the, um, the patterning of the animal. This is a, a spots on a cow. Now, there are actually two kinds of parchment. Um, there's cloth, which is what I was, uh, showed you pictures of before. That's you know, translated as parchment. Gvil, I don't even know if it has a translation. Maybe it's also called parchment or it's just called gvil. Um, the difference is that gvil is the full skin, whereas the parchment is actually just, um, the cloth is actually um, just part of the skin. It's not the full skin. So gvil is used um, or had been used, uh, was traditional in Sephardi communities, um, still is used in some cases. This, um, I believe, is a picture of a, Yemeni, of a Yemenite scroll. Um, and you can see actually the tint is different. It's like an, or it's a darker color. It's like an orangish color. Um, sometimes it's quite bright orange um, and it's heavier because it's the full, uh, the full skin. Okay, I'm gonna do one more slide and then come back for some questions, see if there are questions. Um, so I do not make my own parchment. Um, first of all, it's, well, you, you know, it's, you need a lot of space and ideally a water source, meaning like a natural water source to kind of wash things. And it, it's pretty, it's pretty smelly. Um, but so I, I, I buy my parchment um, and this is a scribal store in Jerusalem. I actually still purchase from them and they, they ship it from Israel. Uh, I now live in New York. I, I did used to live in Israel. Um, there's, it's an interesting dynamic, right? Because um, as you might be able to tell, um, it's, he, you know, the people that run the store are um, ultra-Orthodox and they might not you know, approve of a woman writing a scroll. Um, and some of the stores don't and they won't sell to us. Um, but th um, this one particular store uh, were always very kind to, um, to the women that went in. Once a few women went in together, we were writing a scroll, a collective scroll. And um, we'd always kind of done like the don't ask, don't tell policy. Like if you remember, you know, Clinton and, um, and that, that, whole, uh, that whole policy about LGBTQ people in the, in the army, say don't ask and don't tell. We'll just like not talk about it, right? 
But then they once asked, um, so who, we were choosing pieces of uh, parchment for a scroll. And they finally asked, they said, so, so who's writing this scroll? We kind of looked at each other, like, should we, should we say? And so we did, we said, well, we're, we're writing it. And he said, oh, he kind of nodded and said, oh, for a reform, this is in Hebrew, he's saying, for a reformy, a reform congregation? He said, yeah, actually. So it was this um, kind of very sweet um, exchange and cultural exchange almost. Um, okay, I said I'm going to come back before the quill. Um, questions in the chat box. Okay, <laughs> we have all the, all the other animals. I mean, tech, any animal that's kosher, technically, um, sure, it could be, you know, you could write, you could write so, uh, sacred writings on it. Um, but in terms of production and in terms of like what, um, what's, available it's mostly these days on cow most cow mostly and then you know as i said also goat um goat has been pretty traditional um uh okay perhaps the, the heavenly version of the torah include includes the white and the and the black letters making six hundred thousand. right so if you count all the white space in between perhaps um perhaps we could reach that number in the talmud that six hundred thousand. um how much scroll is required. So it depends on the layout, but for example, for the tour that I just wrote, it required 62 sheets. So um, 62 pieces of parchment. How expensive is the most expensive parchment? So um, parchment is quite, ex it's, it's definitely the most expensive material for creating a scroll. It runs about, about $5,000, um, maybe four, four or five, maybe even more, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I never buy it all at once, but about that figure um, for the entire scroll. Okay, so someone who is not Jewish, can they write a Sefer Torah? So traditionally, no, um, the Sofer is a Jew. Um, also traditionally, the Sofer is a man, um, but, um, but that, but um, yeah, there are other, qualifications, like um, you have to be an adult um, and you have to understand Hebrew. I think I saw that question as well, like do I understand Hebrew? Um, yes, I do. And um, there's a question about ink. Okay, I'm gonna get to the ink in a minute. Any other questions before? Okay, here's one more. Yes, I'm, I'm commissioned directly by synagogues to create a scroll. Um, and there's no difference in the scroll depending on the denomination. They all, they all look the same. Um, and how are the sheets put together? I'm going to get to that. Um, why isn't papyrus used? Okay, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to answer the papyrus question because we're, we're on parchment now. So um, actually, like ancient sections of Torah are, have been found on, on papyrus. So um, the parchment, I, I won't say it's new. I mean, like two, how, 2,000 years, you know, it's not that new, but um, it's not the oldest manner of writing these sacred texts. However, once the scroll, once the idea of the Sefer Torah, like the full scroll and the, the rules around how it's done, then it was, um, it was done on animal parchment. And that is the, that is the halakha. Um, though, again, you know, there are communities, people that are interested in exploring the possibility of writing on something else, whether they're vegetarian or for some other, some other reason, but, um, but it's not, it would not be considered a kosher um, Torah in traditional sense. Can you make a Torah of any size? Okay. I have to tell you, I saw once a Torah that was this high. It was like the size of a mezuzah. And it must have taken the scribe like years to write because it's it's pretty it's much harder to write small than to write big, right? You look at a Torah, you're like, oh, that giant Torah that must have cost a lot. Well, the parchment costs a little more, but in terms of the the work, it will take less time to write than a tiny scroll. So it can be very tiny, um, though there are standard sizes, right? So a lot of congregations um, want to balance between it being, you know, readable like big enough to read comfortably, but not being so heavy that you can't lift it. 
um, especially now that uh, a lot of congregations, um, you know, are egalitarian and, and women are also lifting Torahs and, you know, not that there aren't as strong women as men. Um, I lift the Torah, I do, but um, overall, you know, just to make it easier for everyone to, to lift the Torah. Um, okay, so the errors I'm going to come back to. So from going through an apprenticeship. Um, how do you find, how do you find an apprenticeship where there isn't a large Jewish population? So yeah, so I, um, I did, I learned directly from um, scribes and also apprenticed for a scribe and worked on Torah repair for quite some time. Um, you know, these days, wow, these days so much is on the internet. Um, and, you know, you could find a teacher to work remotely. Um, in fact, my teacher, Jen, taught herself, uh, really was self-taught for, I think, most of what she learned. And so, um, you know, while you do need to have a mentor, it doesn't necessarily need to be someone who is in the same location as you. Um, you've heard that the letters have changed over time. Um, some of them perhaps have, I and mean, for a lo for a long time they've been the same though. Um, but but yeah, there are definitely early, you know certain versions that are slightly different, um, and certain cases where um, where if where you might think, okay, this is this was kind of, this was probably a scribal error that got copied over, <laughs> um, and is now the tradition. So. Um, uh, do you have to go to mikvah before writing God's name? So I'm going to get to, I, I'm going to get to God's name, though I, um, though I'll, I'll answer briefly. You, the mikvah is, um, suggested in general, um, for a scribe doing their work, but it's not like an everyday, you don't have to go every day, um, as a necessity. And, and, um, so that answers, um, The cost of a Torah, that really ranges. Probably the low end of a new safer Torah is about 40, 45, um, and the upper end like 125. Um, okay, uh, have I ever done a Vav Torah? So I'm gonna explain what a Vav Torah is. Um, a Vav Torah, um, and the answer is I've only done Vav Torahs. A Vav Torah is a certain layout of a Torah where every column begins with the letter Vav. I take that back. Not every column begins with the letter Vav. For example, the first column does not begin with the letter Vav because the first column begins with the word Bereshi. And there's a few other columns that don't just because of uh, you know, necessity for those columns, but most of the columns begin with the letter Vav. This is a great classic case um, of halacha, Jewish law kind of competing with um, um, a sort of tradition and, and the fun that people have. So at a certain point in time, a scribe was like, oh, cool, look what I can do. I can, you know, make it so that every column begins with a vav. How awesome is this? And then in the halakhic literature, it talks about this. It says, some people have started doing this thing where they start every column with a vav, and it's a terrible idea because you're going to be stretching letter, stretching words and squishing them in order to get this pagination to work. Don't do it. Meanwhile, it has become the standard um, pagination for new Torahs, um, and most new Torahs these days are, uh, are vav Torahs. Okay, other questions. Um, do I do more repair work than new Torah? Um, I actually do more uh, writing of new Torahs than, than repair work. Um, yes, okay, so Ashkenazi and Sephardi, and Sephardi writing. Um, yes, I, you can tell the difference. I mean, there are, so I wasn't gonna get to writing at, until the end, but, um, but you know what, let's, let's do it now. So broadly speaking, all Torahs are written in a certain script, and that script is called Ashurit. Ashurit is um, the name of the script that was adopted uh, in, the, in the exile in Babylonia because it, it's from a place called Ashur. That's why it's called Ashurit. Now, this script did not exist at the time when we would place revelation at Sinai. So, um, so there's a whole, that's a whole other interesting discussion that we're not going to get into, like what script was used in the, like when the Torah was first given, uh, not Asherit, but, um, but Asherit is, 
is for all of the Torahs. Now, that being said, there are many styles of ashery. And we can, you make, we can make one kind of big division, Ashkenazi and Sephardi, though then there are like lots of other stylistic divisions. And I'm not an expert. Certain people can say, oh yeah, Germany, 17th century, you know, Romania, 19th century. Um, I can't really do that. Um, and I think, um, I think that's, you know, that's really for scholars. I tried to, I, 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 I am still learning about that. Um, but for example, I can open up a scroll. I, I will know if it's Sephardi writing um, simply by looking at the shin because the Sephardi shin is um, flat at the bottom and the Ashkenazi shin is pointed at the bottom. So that's kind of like one easy marker for how you could um, tell the difference. Um, okay, errors again, I will, I will return to the errors. Okay, I'm gonna, Ben, can you look at these uh, texts that have come in, maybe the last like 15? <laughs> and while I'm, while I'm uh, going through the next um, slides, maybe, choose, maybe pick out like a few. Thanks. Okay, so the feather. Um, or I should say the pen. Um, it's traditional to use a reed or a feather quill. Um, a reed is the most ancient uh, writing instrument and it's still used by many Sephardi scribes today, uh, mostly primarily. There are probably some Ashkenazi scribes that do, but I, I don't think it's that common. And it's most common these days for everyone to use a feather. Um, I use a turkey feather and um, I, you know, neither a reed nor a feather come as a pen, right? You have to cut them and you kind of shave the sides and put a slit down the center. Um, and that is the ink channel and the ink holds um, in that, in that channel. You can see in the, in the middle picture. Um, it's pretty difficult to learn. I thought it was, maybe it's not that difficult. It was difficult for me to learn how to properly cut the quill. Um, that was a skill that that took some time mastering. Not that I can really even say that I've mastered it, but I can cut a good quill that works for me. That's the other bit is you have to learn how to cut a quill that works for you because everyone likes to write a little bit differently. Some people like more flow. Some people like more control. Um, okay, so the ink. Uh, Torah ink is uh, is an iron gall ink, um, which means that it it is processed with um, uh, using gall nuts. If you don't know what a gall nut is, uh, it's not a nut. Basically, it happens on certain trees when wasps lay when wasps lay their eggs on um, on the leaves of a tree, and the tree essentially has like an allergic reaction to the wasp being there and laying their, their eggs and it forms the tree forms these balls that you see on the left those are the um that's kind of like the like a mosquito bite right <laughs> like like the blowing up of the tree um around the the wasp eggs what you're seeing on the bottom right is the inside of one of those balls and that is the wasp larva once the wasp larva grows into a wasp he makes his way out of that ball, makes like a little hole and gets out. And then we crush those balls and uh, mix them with, um, with iron sulfate and some other ingredients, including gum, uh, gum Arabic to kind of make the ink sticky and something also liquidy. So like it can have pomegranate juice or wine. I think that probably some of the inks have vinegar um, because I, I can smell it. Um, so that, <laughs> that is what the Torah ink is made of. When I do this lecture for, you know, fifth and sixth graders, they love this. They're like, oh, gross. Um, so I do not make the ink. I buy the ink. The ink is actually pretty difficult to, to make. It has to, it has to be totally, it has to be right. If it, you know, it has to stay, it has to be black and it has to stay black for, you know, permanently. I mean, it will fade, but if it turns a different color, it's like it wasn't, you know, it's not kosher. Um, okay, um, people were asking how the sheets are attached. They are not crazy glued. They are sewn, um, and they're sewn with something called gied. I'm going to show you, actually, I have all these materials here. I'll sure show you in the screen in a, in a moment. 
Um, the gid is like the, the dried veins and like tendons of a kosher animal. And they're basically like pounded and um, kind of twisted together and spun. Um, the process is kind of, is sort of secret, but I saw a lecture on someone who met someone who made ghee and they were using Coca-Cola cans to like pound the ghee. I don't know. Um, and it, it's pretty costly. One spool um, is, is quite costly, not as costly as the parchment, but the, the string, this is, the Torah has to be sewn with ghee. It can't be sewn with just like regular yarn um, or string or something else. It has to be geed. Um, and the geed is strong. It's not so strong that you can't rip it, right? They don't, you don't try to rip it, but, um, but it holds it together. Now, I just sewed, I just finished sewing this Torah uh, a, week or, a week or two ago. And um, I wanted to show you some of the tools that are used um, to, to sew the Torah together. So in addition to the geed, you need a needle to thread it through. Um, and that sharp tool is an awl, and you poke holes in the edges of the sheets of Torah um, in order that you can pull the needle through. And those, those pliers, those jewelry pliers are just to pull the needle through because the parchment's thick and it gets, you know, get, can get stuck. Um, I do remember the first time that uh, I, you know, was poking holes in a Torah. It was very disturbing. What, you want me to like, like use a sharp object and put holes in a Torah. And I think one of my students, Haley is here. I think you experienced the same thing um, in, uh, in poking holes in the Torah, but you do get used to it. And, and to clarify, it's not, you know, where the letters are, it's at the edges so that you can sew the sheets together. Okay. Um, a Torah, as you may know, has no vowels, no cantillation marks, no punctuation. The only like marks there are, are tagin. Um, and these are kind of these little tiny crown, crowns on top of seven different letters. These are the letters that get the crowns, shin, ein, tet, nun, zain, gimel, and sadi. And every time they appear, whether in their regular form or their final form, they get the crowns. Now at the bottom, I show you samples of different crowns. There is a joke that a Torah scribe's crowns look like them. So mine would be like on the shorter side, <laughs> kind of squatty. Um, and you know, like a tall, graceful person would have like these long, lanky um, uh, crowns. But that's just kind of like a myth. I don't think that's actually true. Um, okay. So I wanted to point out some interesting, like different fun things that are in the Torah. And most of the Torah is like, you know, just mostly the same um, in terms of the, you know, writing letters and the, and the lines look the same. However, there are certain places that have very large letters and also very small letters. So here's probably the most famous example of where there are large letters. And this is the Shema. The ayin is large and the dalit is large. And there's lots of interpretations for why, right? Just as there are interpretations for why the other letters are large as well. Um, and one interpretation does not cancel out the other, right? There can be multiple ideas for why these letters are, are large or, um, or similarly, why other tiny letters are tiny. Um, there are also the inverted nuns now, these are called in Hebrew um, nun hafucha, and most typically you'll see them, can you see where my, can you see my cursor? Oops. <laughs> okay. So most typically you'll see them as um, nuns on their side, so twisted, backwards, like instead of facing the left, facing the right, if you know what a nun looks like. So here's a regular nun right here. So usually it will just be flipped. And so the opening will be to the right instead of to the left. But I saw this one scroll once where the nuns were actually upside down, right? And you can tell that they're upside down um, even if you don't know the letter because the crowns are on the bottom, right? The crowns are normally on the top of the letter. So these backwards nuns or these inverted nuns, upside down nuns, bracket um, one line in the Torah, one verse, and that verse is chanted during the Torah service by Hebin Soha Aron Vayomer Moshe. A couple more special things, and then I'm going to come back to questions. 
Okay. So there's two places where the, the, actually the style, the layout looks different. One is at the Song of the Sea, um, Shiratayam it's called. And this is the Israelites crossing the sea and they, they sing a song um, possibly once they, while they're crossing, possibly once they're already on the other side. Um, and people talk about how it looks like the two walls of water, right? The Torah says that the water was mimina, um, mimina mismolam, to their right and to their left. So this is like walls of the water to the right and the left, right? Like here and here. And in the center are the people walking through. So that's one interpretation of why it looks like that. Um, on the top right, dots above letters. Has anyone ever seen a dots on top of letters in the Torah? I, I can't see your answer, but, um, <laughs> but I will when I come back. Um, there are 11 different places where there are dots on the on top of uh, letters or a word um, or a couple words in the Torah. And this is one example. Um, this is, let's see. Okay, this is um, when Asab and Jacob are re, are meet, meet up after many years and of, after, you know, uh, not good relations. And the Torah says that Esau um, puts his head on, on his brother's neck and kisses him. This word that has the dots over it, Vaisha Kehu, and he kissed him. And the rabbis, they interpret these dots to mean that there's like uh, another, lay, another story to the story, right? What, what does it mean? He kissed him? Mm, maybe he actually bit him, right? He went in to kiss him, but he bit him instead. So these are some of the interpretations. That, uh, possibly the dots mean that the scribes weren't sure if that word should be there. On the bottom right, we have the only broken letter, the only intentionally broken letter in the Torah. There is a tradition, um, not among everyone, but among um, at least Ashkenazi uh, Torahs, to have the, the vav of this shalom in um, a certain section. This is um, the section of Pinchas, um, when Pinchas, uh, who is, uh, is very zealous and ends up murdering people who he does not like their behavior. And then he gets a, a breach, a, um, a covenant of peace, it says, a covenant of peace with God, which is kind of funny or ironic given the violence. Um, and this word shalom in the covenant of peace, shalom being the word peace, the vav is intentionally broken. So at least I interpret this as meaning maybe that was not like a full complete piece because it was violent. Um, so anyway, if you're ever fic making a repair on a Torah, if you ever see a broken, this broken letter, it, it's meant to be broken. It's not a mistake. Okay. I'm going to come back for a few minutes and see if there are questions. Ben, did, uh, were there a few that, a few highlights? There were a whole bunch. Um, Great. Uh, somebody asked how the lines are kept straight on the columns uniform. Okay, so yeah, the lines are actually kept straight because there's a line etched in. Um, the Torah is scored and it has to, it actually has to be scored. It's one of the, uh, one of the rules that the Torah has to be scored and so you follow, it's like a top score line. So you follow it on top and the letter goes about halfway down. What's the difference between a $45,000 Torah and a $120,000 Torah? Um, they could, part of it is the experience and the, maybe the beauty of the writing of the scribe. And part of it is just sort of basic economics of where the scribe lives and, and how much their rent costs. Um, are the parchment scrolls sewn together as you go or are they all sewn together at the end? Um, that, that, will depend on the scribe, but I, um, what did I do this time? I think, so I, I get them proofed. So we'll get to the errors, but I, I get the whole, you know, I, I make sure that the pieces are uh, correct before I sew them together because it would be more difficult to fix all the mistakes once it's all sewn together. So I essentially, I mean, that's essentially like waiting till the end. Um, and then I, and then I sew it all together, but you can sew as, as you go along for sure. We also had a question about experimental Torahs, um, whether there are Torahs with dyed parchment and illuminations, or they all follow the same basic style. 
Um, yeah, not, I'm not that I not that I've heard of. It's not permitted halakhically to have um, illuminations or illustrations in the Torah. Um, I actually have a funny case I'm going to show you if we get to it. Um, but but no. So so the answer. I, I mean, there may be, but um, but I'm not familiar. How do? Okay, I just saw a question come in. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that one. How do I ensure leaving sufficient room? Right, because you cannot. You actually cannot have like half a word and then a dash and then the, the rest of the word on the next line, you have to fit everything in. Um, so that's actually a good place to go to the next. Um, this is a tikkun. It's what I'm copying from. It's actually the scan of a handwritten Torah. So you have to be copying from another Torah. And the notation on the left is actually, see these, these, uh, these, Hebrew letters that are kind of, they're not part of the Torah. They're notations that tell me how long the line is relative to an average length of a line. So I know in advance, and you just get used to it as you get more experience, um, how much room you have left. And, and you know, you do stretch and you squish, like this blue arrow, even, you know, even the scribe that, of the, you know, the Torah that so many people are copying from, you know, stretched this letter hay in order to get to the end of the line, and that is perfectly normal. Other questions? Let's see. Okay, um, so it seems like people are really excited to get to the idea of mistakes because, you know, we all <laughs> make mistakes and we all, we all just, uh, um, thank you for assuming that there are mistakes. I mean, there, there's a strong myth out there that if you make a mistake, you have to start the whole thing over, right? And I joke about like, I'm in month, you know, four, 14 of a commission and I call up and say, sorry, it's going to be another two years. I, I made a mistake. Um, it's just too long of a document for there not to be any mistakes. I mean, it's, it's just not, it's not human, right? We could have a robot do it, but we don't. So, um, so what happens with mistakes is that, um, well, first of all, I have, I, I, I proofread it, um, and I have someone proofread it, and a computer proof, proofreads it. So how's a computer proofread it? I send a scanned picture of, um, of every column, and there's a program, a computer program, and it sends me back a report here are all the errors. Here's where it looks like letters might be touching. Usually they're not because the it's like very sensitive, the computer program, but I can see, okay, they're not touching and it's okay. Um, but it's, it's great. And then, um, and then I fix all those mistakes and that's it. There are certain mistakes that cannot be fixed. And this is the funny picture that I wanted to show you having to do also with the illustration question. Okay, this is a picture, I don't know if anyone's heard of the St. John's Bible, it's a project to hand write and illuminate the whole um, uh, Christian Bible, the, the Old Testament and New Testament. Um, and there were 10 scribes working on this project. Um, I don't know if you can tell by this picture, sorry, it's a little bit blurry, but it's the, I don't actually have a copy, I just, I saw it once. Um, the scribe was writing and they forgot a line. They just skipped a line by accident. And what did they do? They wrote the missed line at the bottom, and then they made a little birdie, and the birdie's beak is pointing into the spot where the line is supposed to go, right? Now, this is not, uh, you cannot do this with a Torah, because A, you can't have illuminations, and B, you couldn't put the line at the bottom that's supposed to be towards the top. So if I skipped a line, and in fact, I'll show you, I, I'm pretty sure this is, happened here. I sadly did this with this column. I had to cut this column off. Um, luckily, it was at the end, so I could save the first three columns. If it was in the middle, I wouldn't be able to save it because each sheet has to have at least three columns on it. So, um, so that's, but that's sort of the worst case scenario is losing an entire sheet, right? An entire sheet, maybe like a week of work. Um, and you would have to bury the sheet or keep it for educational purposes, as I've done with this sheet. Um, and um, but you you would never you would not lose the entire Torah. I mean, you could always you know fix something. You could always rewrite a single sheet. Um, and in fact, that happens a lot with repair, right? An older Torah 
with one sheet that's always like, you know, does anyone want to guess which is the most, which is the um, sheet in most need of replacement in a Torah? This is a trivia question. I'll wait, I'll wait 20 seconds for see if anyone wants to guess. Okay, someone guessed the first one. The first one does often need a lot of repair, and um, that's not the answer I was looking for, but it does because, because that Sechayim, the poles are near it, and there's like friction, and sometimes the knots of the of the gid, which are atta which attach the first sheet and the last sheet to the to the the, the staves, it can mess. It can really mess that up. So yeah, the first sheet um, and last sheet do need to be replaced. Okay, people are guessing the Ten Commandments must be one for the chagim. You're getting closer because the that one is repeated. Okay, so it's so it's the the Rosh Chodesh reading. Um, it's uh, it's Pinchas. It's actually the portion I mentioned before. So because the, the Rosh Chodesh is the celebration of the month and it's read um, every month. So it's opened, you know, way more than most sections of the Torah. And by that simple exposure, it's just, uh, you know, in, in, in more disrepair. It, even just be exposed to oxygen, uh, Torah, the ink will start to, you know, over time disintegrate. Okay. Um, I have a little bit more, and then I will come back for final questions, um, and then we'll wrap up. How's that sound? Stop. All right, great. Uh, okay, so I mentioned, okay, if we want to have no mistakes, we would have a robot write it to the Torah. Now, this is a this was a real thing. Um, the first Torah that I wrote was for a museum in San Francisco, the Contemporary Jewish Museum, and I was on display and I wrote the Torah, people watched. Um, and about a year or two later, I kept getting um, messages. Did you hear, did you hear what they're doing at the Jewish Museum in Berlin? I heard they had, they did a similar exhibit all about what's a Torah, what goes into making it. Um, but they had a, a robot make the Torah. Um, they pro someone programmed this, and I can't remember what it's called, like a Torah bot or something. <laughs> and it writes calligraphy with the liquid ink. It spits it out. And I joked it took the robot three months because the robot didn't need to eat lunch or like sleep or anything or take any breaks. And um, so why not? It doesn't cost. It costs way less. I mean, once you pro you know, I'm sure the robot costs way more to create, but once you have the robot, it costs way less. There are definitely no mistakes because the robot is programmed um, and it's all very easy to read. Um, but in fact, the letters, they all look the same. Um, and I think one of, like, kind of, I think about like the more sort of, I wanna say spiritual reasons, but I guess that's the right word um, for why we have maintained the tradition of a human writing a scroll, right? when scrolls were first being written, it's just that that was the only option. There wasn't the option to print a scroll. Once the, there was the advent of the printing press, um, there was that option. And there in fact, at that point was a, a halachic debate, a debate, a legal Jewish legal debate around should a printed Torah be considered like a Torah scroll, should it be kosher? And uh, ultimately the decision was no, it shouldn't be. And it came down to intent. Remember I talked about that um, statement of intention that a scribe makes at the beginning, like I'm doing this for the sake of the sanctity of the Torah. The idea is that a robot or something mechanical cannot have that intent. Um, and that there is something about a person, a human being putting themselves um, and all their energy into the creation of something that makes it unique. Additionally, all Torah scrolls are completely different, right? Because each one is handwritten. So you can never have, I mean, handwriting is like a fingerprint. Even a to two Torahs that I write there, they are not the same. Um, and so um, that also adds to the specialness and the uniqueness of a Torah scroll. So that, oh, it, it I'm not gonna get to scripts, but that's your, <laughs> that's your little, uh, that's your little uh, invitation to look into ancient Hebrew scripts. Um, 
but I want to come back and see if there were any more questions, um, maybe ones that we missed. If we missed your question, if you want to put it in the chat again, um, because I don't know that we will find it, everything, and um, I'd love to answer questions. Um, this is the end of the formal lecture. Um, okay. Okay, yes, yeah, some scrolls, um, some scrolls are not connected to, let's say, Chaim, that they're in a, like, a box, right? Sometimes you'll see, sometimes you'll see them with, with the poles also inside of a box or just, or just, like, in a, a box. Um, I don't provide, no, the, well, sure, I mean, it depends what the congregation wants. I've only worked with congregations that wanted the scroll, the, the parchment, um, sewn to that say Chaim to the poles. Okay. Um, I've seen a Torah with cellophane tape and was told it was still kosher. If we don't know what the glue on the tape is, wouldn't that make it no longer kosher? Was it holding? <laughs> I don't know who wrote that. Um, I mean, it's not, it would have to have gied. I mean, if it had tape, if it had additional tape, you know, that might be fine, but it, but it has to be, um, you know, it sort of depends what the function of the, the tape is, is doing. But yeah, for glue, like um, if I'm doing repairs, I use, I have to use a glue that doesn't have anything not kosher. I think some glues have like hor um, horse material from like horse hooves. Um, so it has to be like a, a non-animal based glue. Um, to glue like patches from the back. So if, if there's a small section that um, needs to be cut out and repaired, you can, you can ta uh, not tape, sorry, glue a piece of parchment from behind and, and rewrite the section. So, but that would all have to be kosher. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, it would depend sort of what the tape was doing. I, I'm not sure. Um, the program, the programmer had the intent to do the code as a spiritual goal. Well, that is the argument that some people make, the people that want, you know, for this is the robot that they say, okay, but the human, the, someone programmed it, and also the human that starts the, the robot doing the writing, they also make a statement of intention. Um, can I repeat the thing that I said about leaving one letter out and what it meant that it's invalid? Yes. So the Torah has to have all of its letters exactly, exactly. And if it's missing a letter or something is misspelled, the Torah is not kosher. And in fact, um, I don't know if anyone has ever seen this. Um, I've seen it happen. We're at services. And um, even if there's a letter that looks maybe too much like a different letter. So there was an issue. There, a person was chanting Torah. Then they get to a letter. And they were like, this is borderline. So an example of something that might be borderline, if you know Hebrew letters, um, could be like a... a, a um, a dalit and a resh, right? If the dalit is too rounded, it looks a little like a resh. So let's say the reader gets to a word and they're like, I don't know, this, this dalit, I'm not sure, it might look a little too much like a resh. If it's a clear case that, that you know, maybe a letter, if a letter is missing or if it's a clear case, it's not the right letter, you're supposed to put the Torah away and you have a month to get it fixed. If you have another Torah, you can read from that Torah or if you didn't have another Torah, you wouldn't complete the reading. And, um, but if it's a borderline case, what do you do? You ask a child. You ask a child to come up and you say, what letter is, what letter is this? <laughs> and whatever they say, that's, that's what holds, right? Again, this is if it's a borderline case. Um, it's great when I do the, when I talk to uh, Hebrew school kids and I say, who do you ask? They say, the rabbi, the scribe, you know, the expert, I'm like, no you. <laughs> we ask you. Um, are particular scribes works recognizable? Um, I don't think like on a large scale, but um, I think I could recognize my own writing, but I'm not even totally sure about that. Um, what is on a Dalid top? I'm not, I don't totally understand that question. I'm sorry. Um, Marlene, do you want to explain? Um, what makes a Torah so heavy? Is it the wood? Partially the, the part, I mean, the Torah is like kind of heavy, but the wood can make a huge difference. If you have a heavy Torah, if you're part of a synagogue is a heavy Torah, um, that is actually a way to greatly reduce the weight of the Torah is to get different atzei chaim, light atzei chaim, and, and have it re-sewn. 
how much does the Torah weigh? It totally depends on the size of the Torah and, and also on the Sechayim. Um, do I create scrolls from Mizuzo? I, yes, I, I do that too. I forgot to mention scribes, you know, we're trained to write uh, Torah, uh, Megillah, the uh, Esther, Mezuzah, and Tefillin. Oh, you're so welcome. Thanks for being here. What, what kind of covers are usually used? Um, so, like, people choose different kind of covers. They're, they're like, many are velvet. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not part of, it's not considered part of the Torah. It's kind of the accoutrements. Um, yes, this is being recorded and I will put it on my Jewish Learnings YouTube channel, hopefully by end of day tomorrow. Does someone certify the work error free or are you trust to do that yourself? So yeah, no, there was this whole thing of the computer check and also uh, proofing. Um, so definitely do not trust myself to be error free. Um, you sew the Torah together. Do you use a strap to keep it rolled? Um, no, I roll it um, very tightly, and um, I don't use a. And then at the end, I you know there's a belt. Once it's closed, the belt keeps it tight. Is a scroll considered uh, by Orthodox kosher when done by a woman? Uh, no, not um, not that I not that I'm aware of. Perhaps there are some. Um, perhaps there's an Orthodox community that would accept it, but um, traditionally no. Um, you went to a town, you went to a temple that adopted a Torah scroll. Um, and if you made a donation, you could write a letter and there was a sofa to guide you. Is this legit? It's a, yes, it's a common, um, it's a, it's sort of a common way to raise money for the synagogue and the scroll that the person helps write the letter. Often what happened is they write it with the scribe or the scribe makes an outline of the letter and they fill it in. So the thing about this is that an outline of the letter is, means the letter was already created. So in, in effect, the, the sofer was making that letter. Um, if a mistake is found after the Torah is sold, how is the error fixed? So it sort of depends. I mean, probably the, whatever's easiest. So either, you know, if the scribe lives close, so they would, the scribe that did it, you know, would fix it. If the scribe is no longer around and the Torah is a hundred years old, so, um, a, a local scribe would come to uh, come to fix the error. Um, okay, so some of the major differences to Ashkenazi and Sephardi Torah writing. So I was explaining about the the, diff the letters look different. Um, if you want to like look up the scripts, um, there are many different styles even within those two kind of broad groupings. Um, but one is that the sh Sephardi shin is flat and the Ashkenazi shin is pointed. On top of a dalid, there's one projection like on a, oh, okay, I think, right, so a, the dalid has, so there were the letters that have the three crowns, a dalid and a hey, some other letters, kuf, have one crown, like one little line sticking up. So I, I think that's, I, hope, I think Marlene, that's what you were asking about. Um, yes, you will have access to the recording. Um, if you can't find it, you can email me at julie at myjewishlearning.com and, and I will send you the link. And have I had a good close-up look at ancient scrolls other than Torah? I haven't, but I would, I would like to. Um, I mean, you mean other, oh, I've seen, I've seen old Megillahs, but I don't know, um, I don't know if you mean like um, from, texts from other traditions. Okay, let's see. Ben, am I missing anything? There's a couple more trick trickling in if you want to get every last one. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 44 behind, I just realized. Maybe that's why people are asking questions of things that I talked about at the end. I just realized I was looking at them. <laughs> I, I, uh, and I said in the advertisement, there will be ample time for questions. Well, they're, they're keeping you to it. Um, Martin wants to know if you signed the Torah in any way? No, it is totally anonymous, not signed at all. Um, uh, yeah, fixing letters, I scrape it off. I do scrape off the letter and I rewrite it. Anything else that you see, Ben, standing out? How many scribes are there working in the in the United States? I don't know. Not a ton, but not just five. That's kind of big. I'm I'm really not sure. Um, uh, 
uh, correcting the errors. Do you have to cut the whole sheet out if, or do you have to cut the whole sheet out or can you fix the one letter? Oh, you can definitely fix the one letter. Sorry, that wasn't clear. You can fix the one letter. There are certain cases where you would not be able to fix to fix it, like if you skipped a line, because you can't scratch off a whole column. It would take forever and it would look terrible. Um, or there's also the case I said I would get to the names of God, which I didn't. Names of God require special intention um, before writing them. And um, there, and if you make a mistake, it sort of depends what, how, what, and how, but there is a situation where you would have to rewrite that whole sheet. Um, and I think I, I think I went over time and I'm really sorry I didn't get to all the questions. Um, if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to email me. Um, and thank you so much for being here for this presentation. It's really, um, it's inspiring to see so many people interested in Torah. And I wish everyone a uh, happy Sukkot um, and Chag Sameach and Shabbat Shalom. Um, and I hope to see you at another My Jewish Learning event soon. We have a class tomorrow morning at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. It's a group Torah study that will be led by Rabbi Menachem Creditor. Um, so I'll hopefully see you there, bright and early. Good night, all. <laughs>